Everyone who's read a newspaper over the past 20 years knows the name of Mikis Lianos, the most flamboyant tycoon of his generation, multi-millionaire entrepreneur. He was a compulsive womanizer and husband in succession of five rich and beautiful wives, a man who appeared to have the world at his feet until he came a tumble over a pretty chemist's assistant in Fulchester. Linda Davis lived not in central Fulchester, but a dozen or so miles away in the seaport suburb of Shingleborough, where one fine evening Mikis Lianos put in for repairs to his world-famous yacht, the Liana. What transpired on the quay of Shingleborough and later in the five-star Mid-Atlantic Hotel in Fulchester are now the subject of our proceedings in the Fulchester Crown Court. Mikis Lianus, husband and lover of some of the world's most beautiful and eligible women, is now in the dock accused of raping chemist assistant Linda Davis. Miss Helen Tate has finished her opening speech for the Crown and is now examining her first witness, Linda Davis. <laughs> and the jury, how you first came to meet the accused, Mikis Lianos. Well, me and me mate Sandy Georgie... Uh, now, by mates, you mean male or female mates? <laughs> well, female, of course. Sandy Georgie and Evelyn, me girlfriends. Well, we was walking down the quay looking at the yachts coming in for repairs. So you and your friends, Sandy Georgie and Evelyn, were walking down the quay looking at the ships. The big ship sails down the alley, Miss alley... Miss Davis, and... this will not do. Now, you must remember that you are in a court of law and not at the Palace of Varieties. Yes, my lord. I'm very sorry, my lord. Well, only me and me mates, we always live in hope that one day we'll bump into Aristotle Onassis. Well, leaving aside for one moment your hopes and aspirations, Miss Davis, on this particular occasion into whom did you bump? Well, we was walking along, minding our own business, when up comes this funny little geezer. And he says, good evening, beautiful ladies. That sounds like a terrible crime. The initial approach may have been courtesy itself, my lord, but I would be happy if the witness would be allowed to continue her account of the conversation. Perhaps you would do better, Miss Tate, to identify for members of the jury the gentleman about whom we are talking. To be sure, my lord. Uh, Miss Davis, do you see the man who spoke to you on the quay that night in the court today? Yeah, that miniature little geezer all tied up over there. Miss Davis. I do not wish to cross swords with you or with anybody else in this court, but I must insist that you observe a modicum of courtesy in your answers. Well, I'm sorry, my lord, but he done me wrong, didn't he? That is a matter that the jury will decide in due course. Let it be indicated in the shorthand note that the witness identified the accused. Very well, Miss Tate, please continue. My lord, having greeted you in this fashion, Miss Davis, what next did the accused say to you? Well, he says, would you come to a party? I have very much champagne and the biggest private yacht in the world. And what was your answer to this? Well, I says to him, and your name's Donny Osman. <laughs> and what was the accused's answer to this little shaft of wit? Oh, he didn't seem to get what I was on about. I mean, me mates was laughing, giggling like, you know. Oh, then he says, beautiful young lady, my name is Miki Slianos. I have the biggest private yacht in the world. You must see me very much in the newspaper. And what was your answer? Well, I says to him, I says, look here, love, the grocer's got the biggest private yacht in the world and he's in the papers every bleeding day, but it don't seem to pull no birds for him. <laughs> and, uh, and then, Miss Davis? Well, he seems to get the needle, just mildly, let's say. Then he says, beautiful young ladies you are, but you are also stupid. Politicians may come and politicians may go, but I go on forever. Well, Sandy says... Uh, Miss Tate, is it your intention to call this young lady Sandy as a witness? Uh, no, my lord, it is not. Then, Miss Davis, will you please keep to the facts? Hearsay evidence is not allowed. Well, Sandy says most like he eats them for breakfast. Miss Davis. Mr. Lianos? Mm -hmm. Well, he says, My dear child, I buy them for ballast for my yacht. You do not believe me? Then look, he says. And there down the quay is his biggest yacht I ever seen, just like something in the old films on the telly. Well, then he says, you come to a party? Well, Georgie says... Miss Tate, is it your intention to call this young lady named Georgie? Uh, no, my lord, it is not. Miss Davis, please remember his lordship's warning. Well, I says, behind them lambton bins, I reckon we got ourselves a regular Earl Flynn. Again, I hesitated, mind you, because I'm not stupid, am I? Stupid is the last epithet that I would have applied to you, young lady. 
But your task <coughs> is not to ask the questions. That job for the moment belongs to a, a perhaps somewhat embarrassed Miss Tate. Your Lordship's interventions are always apposite and encouraging. Well, Miss Davis, having hesitated for a decent moment, what did you finally decide to do? Well, I decided to take a chance like. So I says to my mates, come on, we go, but just for half an hour. So I says to this meekis, understand this, we're come, but for half an hour. But understand this, no messing. Positively, no messing. And what was Mr. Leonis's reply to these very proper terms? Oh, he appeared to be amazed. Mind you, he's not a bad actor. Messing, he says. What is this messing? My wife, she is on board the yacht, and she's quite as young and as beautiful as you, so how can we have messing? Fair enough, we says. We go. So off you went. So off we went. And once aboard the lugger? What's that? Ah, my dear lady, the generation gap. The generation gap. I really must hold my tongue, or Mr. Lotterby will have me back in the Court of Appeal. Do please carry on, Miss Ted. My lord. So we all agreed that you and your three friends accompanied Mr. Leonis back to his yacht. That's right. Right. Now, when you got there, what did you find? Well, we goes down into the saloon. Well, there, were, there was these uh, five or six geezers sitting there playing cards and listening to foreign music on the stereo. And what happened when you entered? Well, this Mickey's, he, he speaks to them in a foreign language and they all stand up looking very pleased. Well, then this Mickey's, he says, Champagne. This happy occasion calls for champagne. So one of the geezers goes and opens some bottles of champagne and another one goes off and fetches some titbits, meatballs and the like, you know. So we're drinking our champagne and eating our titbits. And then I says, here, how about some different music, something a bit more lively like? So they put on some other records. What type of records? Oh, some terrible smoochy old-fashioned stuff, Frank Sinatra and the like. So we start to dance. But by this time, I'm getting a li little bit fed up being stuck with this Mickey. I mean, Sandy and Georgie and Evelyn, they're fine because they're dancing with the young geezers and they're quite passable. Now, how did you indicate to Mr. Leonis the fact that you were, as you say, um, getting fed up? Well, I says to him, like I says, here, can't we go somewhere a bit more lively, like a disco or something? Well, then all of a sudden, this vision of loveliness comes in. A vision of loveliness? Yeah, his lady wife. <gasps> She's out here about six months gone, I'd say. Oh, and don't she go off alarming, in her own language, of course, but calling him all sorts, I'd think. And what did the defendant do? Oh, well, he belts her one round the ear on, she runs off crying her bleeding eyes out. Then I says to me, mates, I said, look here, I don't want to be no party to no punch-up, so let's go. So I turns round and I walks up the stairs. And the defendant? Oh, he runs after me, doesn't he? Do not take any notice of my wife, he says, she is crazy. Yeah, and so are you, says I. If you think I'm going to stand around for that sort of carry-on. You can just take me home. And did he, in fact, take you home? Not in your Nelly. Well, I'm just coming to that. So there on the quayside is part of this flipping great Mercedes with the driver asleep in the front seat. What, as a matter of curiosity, happened to your three young friends? Well, they stayed on board the yacht. Aboard the lugger. Well, they wasn't in the line of fire, was they? And what happened to you, Miss Davis? We drove to the Mid-Atlantic Hotel. Well, I deserve something after being insulted, didn't I? After all, I'm not used to it. And at the Mid-Atlantic Hotel? Well, the bar was closed, it being after midnight. So this meek, is, he says, let's have some champagne for a change in my suite. Well, it seems that he was well known there, so he goes up to his suite. And the waiter brings in some champagne and puts on the stereo. So we're drinking the champagne, and after a while we're having a bit of a kiss and a cuddle. Well, I'm nice and mellow by now, aren't I? Well, after a while, his hands start to wander, you see. So I says to myself, aye, aye. Here we go. But then, all of a sudden, he says, You are a beautiful young lady. I find you two very much attractive. I will give you £50 if you let me do this, and an hundred pounds if you let me do that. Now, by this and that, what exactly did you take him to mean? Well, by this I mean intercourse, and by that I mean if we had it the other way. And what was your reaction to the defendant's suggestions? Well, I jumps up off the city and I shouts, Money, you must be out of your flipping mind. I'm not a flipping prostitute. Now, Miss <clears throat> Davis, I want you to listen to me very carefully because it is very important what you say at this stage. Yes, my lord. I'm under oath, aren't I? You are indeed, and I expect you to respect that solemn undertaking. Now, I, I am referring to my notes here. You just said... I jumps up off the settee, shouts at him, Money, you must be out of your flipping mind. I'm not a flipping prostitute. That's right. Now, do I understand you to mean by that answer that you would do for pleasure what you would not do for money? Well, yeah, I've got me principles, don't I? Every girl's got the right to choose. Besides, turn me right off. 
Thank you, Miss Davis. A very fair answer. Continue, Miss Tate. My lord. Now, after you'd made the remark that you've just elucidated for us all, what did the defendant do? Oh, boy, he turns right stroppy, doesn't he? I mean, he acts like he's crazy. First, he shouts, you may not be a prostitute, but I treat you like one. Then he fetches me a couple of clumps, pulls off his, me clothes and has his way with me. Now, by that, exactly what do you mean? He had intercourse with me, against my will. And as a result of that night's episode, in what condition do you now find yourself? I'm nearly three months pregnant. Would you like a glass of water, Miss Davis? Yes, please, miss. Um, I think I'd best sit down, no? Yes, yes of course. You may be seated. Are you quite comfortable, Miss Davis? Yes, thank you, sir. Now, Miss Davis, after the defendant had had intercourse with you, what did he do? Well, he rolls over and starts to snore, like a pig. And you? Well, I waited till he was well and truly asleep. Then I got up, put on my clothes, and I crept out. Now, did you see anyone as you crept out of the Mid-Atlantic Hotel? No. No, the night port was asleep in the hall at the time. There weren't no one else about. And where did you go? Home. I had to walk all the way home. There wasn't any buses. And did you subsequently make a complaint to your parents? Yes, miss. And later on that night, to the police? Yes, miss. To Inspector McGovern, miss. Thank you, Miss Davis. Miss Davis, how old are you? Twenty, sir. Mm -hmm. How tall are you? Five, six, sir. Mm -hmm. How much do you weigh? About nine stones, more or less. <clears throat> well, you certainly look a fine, extremely well-built young woman. As a matter of fact, I'm feeling a little queer right now. Well, even the healthiest of young women sometimes feel a little off-colour during the early months of pregnancy. But in the ordinary way, you would agree that you are a normally healthy girl? Yeah, well, I suffer a bit with my nerves. Miss Davis, would you please stand up? We just said I could sit down. Oh, just for a moment, please. Miss Davis, you will please stand up. Will you face the jury? Now, with your lordship's permission, I should like Mr. Lianus to stand up. Mr. Lianus? Thank you, Mr. Lianus, and thank you, Miss Davis, for your cooperation. You may both sit down. Now, Miss Davis, sir, uh, Mr. Lianus is a man of smallish stature. Although he may have a slight advantage in weight, he is also 63 years of age. Well, how was I to know his age? He's as randy as a rabbit. Uh, Miss Davis, please. <clears throat> I have warned you more than once about being impertinent. Well, I'm sorry, my lord, but I sworn to tell the truth, haven't I? And so he was. And no doubt is. You could see, Miss Davis, you are not only attractive and intelligent, but also articulate. What's that? You express yourself fluently and with ease. Now, Miss Davis, you will no doubt have grasped the point I'm endeavouring to make here. Yeah, I've seen it coming. Good. Then I can put it to you quite plainly, Miss Davis. How is it possible that a young... Healthy, extremely well-built young woman of 20, five foot six inches in height, approximately nine stone in weight. How is it possible that such a perfect specimen of healthy young womanhood can be raped by a small, slight man of 63, a man past the peak of his physical prowess? What you are trying to say, Mr. Lotterby, if I'm not mistaken, is that Miss Davis appears to be the stronger of the two. Thank you, my lord. I could not have put it better myself. Yes, Miss Davis, his lordship is quite right to intervene, and in a language which you can understand, Mr. Lianus did not rape you. You came willingly, and moreover, you made all the running. That's a lie. He may be little, but he's as strong as a lion. Well, the jury have seen you both, and in due course, it will be for them to decide what actually happened. Yeah, well, we just see. Miss Davis, you are a young woman of the world, are you not? Well, I still live at home. You left school at 16, and you've been earning your living ever since. Yeah, and I pay me mum for me keep. You are an extremely attractive young woman, as we can all see, so no doubt you've had plenty of boyfriends. Yeah, I've had a few. And from time to time you've had sexual intercourse with them, have you? What's that got to do with it? On the night you met Mr Lianus, Miss Davis, you were not a virgin, were you? A virgin? At 20? Mr Lotterby, you must be joking. Mr. 
Holmes, you told us a moment ago that at the time you met Mr. Lianus, you were not, in fact, a virgin. No. Stands to reason, doesn't it? I weren't no virgin, but I weren't pregnant, neither. For how long have you been having sexual intercourse with your various boyfriends? Oh, not for a few years. How many years? Look, my lord, do I have to tell him? It don't seem right to me. Yes, I'm sorry, Miss Davis, you, uh, Miss Davis, you have to answer counsel's questions unless I rule otherwise. You have made a very serious allegation against Mr. Lianus, and it is essential that the jury should be able to decide whether or not to believe what you are saying. Very well, Mr. Lotterby. For how many years have you been having sexual intercourse with your various boyfriends? Since I was about 11 or 12. And how many boyfriends? Oh, I don't remember. Do I mean some of them was a long time ago? Six, perhaps? Eight? Twelve? Oh, more than that. Eighteen? Twenty boyfriends? Oh, well, I don't remember. Twenty-five or thirty, more like. Twenty-five or thirty boyfriends? Well, that's quite an impressive total. So, Miss Davis, um, on your own admission, you've allowed yourself plenty of opportunity to get pregnant in the past. Oh, look, sir, I'm not stupid, you know. I mean, in the ordinary way, I take the pill. Ah, well, for how long have you been taking the pill? First time I had an abortion. Wasn't very nice, I can tell you. This time I'm going to keep the baby. An abortion? How old were you when you had this abortion? Fifteen, I think. Something like that. I weren't the only one in my class, neither. You stand on me. Here, in a nutshell, we may perceive the tragedy of our time. Uh, Miss Davis, you have told us that in the ordinary way you take the pill. How is it that at this time you were not, in fact, taking it? Well, puts on weight, doesn't it? It so happens I wasn't going out with Steady with no-one at the time, so I thought I'd come off of it. Come off of it? By that are we to understand that you were no longer taking the pill? No, it stands to reason, doesn't it? I mean, we don't, none of us like swallowing pills for nothing, do we? No, indeed. It's just dead unlucky that I bumped into this meeky, that's all. Dead unlucky or dead crafty, Miss Davis? That, in essence, is the issue the jury will have to decide. My Lord, you tell him he can't talk to me like that. He ought to put his questions proper. Yes, Miss Davis has a point there, you know, Mr Lotterby, and I would prefer it if the use of the vernacular were confined to the witnesses in my court. I beg your Lordship's pardon. I will endeavour to rephrase my question in more formal terms. Miss Davis, I must put it to you that your story about being unlucky is false and that you have fabricated this and other parts of your evidence in order to compromise Mr Leonis. Well, that's a load of old codswell to start with. I sworn to tell the truth, and that's what I done. Miss Davis, your parents are respectable people, are they not? Yeah, they're respectable. They can't be particularly happy about your way of life, can they? What way of life? I only do what everyone else does, don't I? Our old friend, the generation gap, Mr Lotterby. Indeed, my lord. Miss Davis, despite the pattern of life as lived by yourself and your young friends, I can't believe your parents were happy about your enjoying a long series of casual relationships. Well, they never asked no questions. All they ever said was, don't get caught. Don't get caught? Yes, well, here I think we might have the clue to the whole matter because somewhere along the line you did get caught and now you seek to put the blame on Mr Lianos. Oh, you do keep on, don't you? I mean, how many times do I have to say that I didn't ever get caught? This time I was forced against my will and he forced me. Mr Davis, you... Uh, it must have been apparent to you from the first moment you met Mr Lianos that... Uh, uh, he was a man of considerable substance. Very, very rich. Yeah, stinking rich, and flash with it. He's also a well-known figure in international society. Personally, I'd never heard of him. Oh, come now, Mr. Davis, you must read the newspapers. Never. Can't be bothered. Well, watch television? No, nope, haven't got the time. Amazing. Well, be that as it may, you have already agreed that having seen something of Mr. Lianis's lifestyle, you recognise that uh, he was a man of considerable wealth. Yeah, like I said. And as such an obvious target for blackmail. Oh, now, come off that one. That's a very dirty word. Yes, it is a dirty word. You're quite right, Miss Davis, but unfortunately it is a word which from time to time we are compelled to use in this court. I'd like you to look at this document, if you would. Did you write that letter, Miss Davis? Yeah, it's mine. The letter is addressed, is it not, to Mr. Miki Lianos, care of the yacht Liana Monaco? That's right. Now, Miss Davis, how did you know the address to which to direct this letter? Well, I saw a picture of the bold Mickey on, on his yacht in the newspaper, that's how. But a moment ago you told us you didn't read the newspapers. Well, that was before this horrible thing happened. Now I clock him wherever he goes. You clock him? Or do you mean you follow his movements wherever he goes? Yeah, like I said. And I won't bleed my gut off his back till he's done right by me and my baby. Now, Miss Davis, I'd like you to turn to the jury and read aloud the contents of that letter, if you would. 
Dear Miki, next time you put into Shingleboro for a quick one, I think you should look me up. I need help. I need help now, and I should hate to have to say anything against you when your case comes up next month. Yours till death us do part, Linda Davis. My lord, may the, exhibit, the letter be made an exhibit in this case? Yes, Mr. Blood. And the jury see it? Of course. There is, of course, a copy of the exhibit for your lordship yes. and for my learned friend, a 12 for the use of the jury. Now, Miss Davis, what do you want to tell us about this letter? Because if this is not an attempt at blackmail, then I'm the ace of spades. Oh, come off. I mean, what's the blackmail in that? The crime of blackmail, Miss Davis, consists of demanding money with menaces. But I ain't menace no one. Look, all I said was I'd hate to have to say anything against him. And that means to tell the truth. Or to fabricate false and perjured evidence against Mr Li Lianas unless he made you a financial settlement. And what's so wrong with that, may I ask? I was trying to get help for me and my baby. I'm pregnant, aren't I? But not once in that letter do you mention your pregnancy. Yeah, well, I was saving that up for later. For Christmas, perhaps. Or his birthday. His 64th. Thank you, Miss Davis. Uh, Miss Davis, let us once and for all clear up this silly business with the letter. Dear Mickey's next time you put into Shingleboro for a quick one. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, next time you pull in for a quick... A seduction, is that what you're trying to say? S seduction, nothing. Quick spot of rape, I'd call it. Dear Mickey's next time you put into Shingleboro for a quick spot of rape, I think you should look me up. Well, I think you should come and see me. Right. I need help. And so I do. What's so wrong with saying that? What indeed is wrong with that? Hmm. After all, I'm pregnant, aren't I? Miss Davis, we all understand your tragic predicament. I need help now, and I should hate to have to say anything against you when your case comes up next month. Now, what did you mean by that? Well, I need help. That goes without saying, doesn't it? I need help, and I should hate to have to say anything to hurt you. Now, you do need help. But if that help is not forthcoming, what then? then I'd have to tell the truth, and nothing but the truth. Still blackmail. Do you anywhere in this letter express the intention to concoct perjured evidence? To tell a pack of lies? No, miss. Yours till death do us part, Linda Davis. Now, are we to take this as a threat? Did you intend to harm Mr Lianus? No, miss. In any way? Look, miss, I'm not a flipping psychopath. Look, all I meant to say was I'm really his wife or they ain't got no wedding ring. After all, he is the father of my child. Unless your lordship has any further questions. No, Miss Tate. Thank you, Miss Davis. That's all. You may stand down. Please remain in the court. My lord, as we're now approaching the adjournment, it occurs to me that this might be a suitable moment for the deposition of the police photographer to be read. It should only take two or three minutes. I, Stephen John Bailey, a police photographer at present attached to the Fulchester Forensic Science Laboratory as a photographer, make oath and say, on the 14th of July this year at approximately 5.30 in the morning, I proceeded to the Fulchester Central Police Station as the result of a request made by Detective Inspector McGovern. There I was shown a young woman whom I now identify as the witness Linda Davis. As a result of a request of the Detective Inspector McGovern, I photographed first certain marks on the neck of the witness and subsequently certain marks on the lower part of her body. From the untouched negatives of those photographs, I now produce positives, which I identify and are marked exhibits A and B. Signed, Stephen John Bailey. My Lord, there are copies of the exhibits for yourself. Thank you, Miss Tate. And for my learned friend. Yes, I have seen And, of course, for the members of the jury. No, says I'm making it up. Whoever saw love bites like those? The case of the Queen against Lianos will be resumed tomorrow in the Crown Court.